Kramer. Welcome to the regular Friday meeting of the Portland City Club. As usual, our first order of business, and a pleasant one, is the introduction and welcoming of new members to the club. And we have two new members today. I'd ask them to stand uh, as I introduce them. First, Tomika Du, Director of Development at Good Samaritan Foundation, and Lutz Kiso, Chief Research Department, Emanuel Hospital and Health Center. The healthcare people are well represented today. Welcome to City Club. Uh, upcoming events for City Club, first the next Tuesday, May 14th, another open forum, this one on creating community in suburbia, new options for a Gresham neighborhood, sponsored by the Land Use and Transportation Standing Committee of City Club. A team of developers and designers has prepared a development plan for a 300-acre site in Gresham using new neighborhood planning principles. The forum panel will be composed of designers, realtors, government officials, and neighborhood activists they will critique the practicality of that plan and the feasibility of transferring urban neighborhood qualities to suburbia. With the urban growth boundary and such, this promises to be an interesting forum. That's at 7 p.m. in the Montgomery Park Ballroom, 2701 Northwest Vaughan. That is free and open to the public. Uh, next Thursday, May 16th, Science Breakfast. The topic, chaos. A survival course for business. Featuring Dr. Ian Stewart, reader in mathematics at the University of Warwick. Dr. Stewart is a uh, teacher of mathematics, history, math mathematics history, mathematics as culture, pure mathematics, and catastrophe theory. This is serious. This stuff really does exist. He will consider how businesses can cope with chaos and how they might exploit it. Um, chaos is a fascinating topic. I plan to, to take this one in myself. The program is co-sponsored by the City Club Science and High Tech Standing Committee and by the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy at Portland State University. Breakfast served at 7 a.m. The program will begin at 7.30. Breakfast is $9, coffee only for $2.50. Open seating will be available in the back of the room at no charge. It's in the U.S. Bancor Tower, Atwater's Restaurant, 30th floor. Reservations are required. Make them by calling Fast Ticks, that's at 224-8499 by Wednesday, May 15th, 5 p.m. And that program also is open to the public, again, if you don't want breakfast. If you do want breakfast, it's open to you as well. Um, Friday, May 17th, next Friday, here at uh, City Club, Vera Katz, state representative, former speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives, speaking on education reform, Oregon's choice. She's made a name for herself in this in the last month or two. Representative Katz, of course, is the sponsor of House Bill 3565, the Oregon Education Act for the 21st Century. Uh, based on the National Think Tank report, America's Choice, High Skills or Low Wages, uh, Representative Katz's bill has been described as far-reaching and revolutionary, and those are the conservative evaluations of it. This will be here again at the Portland Hilton next Friday, May 17th. On to our very interesting program for today. Our board host seated at the head table is Chuck Williams, member of the Board of Governors, and Media Relations Officer for Good Samaritan Hospital. He will have the privilege, as usual, of asking the first question of our speaker. The second question, which will come from the floor, will be from Tom Stanwood, who is Chair of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee of the City Club. After that, of course, we'll open up the meeting to questions from City Club members only in the audience after our speaker's remarks. Preference will be given to questions from the microphone, but of course, as usual, you'll notice on your table, there are forms for written questions and if you'd please hold those written questions up after the speech, staff will gather them, bring them up to the head table, and I'll sort out the really juicy ones and we can ask our speaker. Our speaker today is Sheila Tobias. She bills herself, uh, among other things, as an academic feminist, and her talk today is titled, How Men Use Military Experience in Politics. You think maybe this doesn't actually happen and we don't see this happening all the time, the use of military experience in politics. I have a quote from a former member of the United States, uh, former, yes, formerly in the United States Navy, uh, Senator Mark Hatfield, that old militarist, right? Well, <laughs> in the election campaign last, late last October, when his opponent had pulled even in the polls, and Senator Hatfield finally went on the offensive, I'm sure you all remember it, but do you remember what he said at the time? And I'm quoting, as quoted in the Oregonian on October 31st, I'm ready to counterpunch now and hit the beaches at Iwo Jima and Okinawa again. I must say I've gotten into the spirit of counterattack. 
It's not my preference, but I can do it. Senator Hatfield. <laughs> Ms. Tobias first achieved her national notice back in 1978 with a book called Overcoming Math Anxiety, which I find fascinating. I've read it in this past week. Uh, the idea first came to her, she has said, as a bit of an epiphany in 1974 while she was associate provost at Wesleyan University. She saw a, st <clears throat> pardon me, a, st a study that indicated of the entering males in the Berkeley uh, class of seven in 1972, 57% had had four years of high school mathematics. Of the entering females, 8%. From this was born an interesting analysis, and she coined the, the uh, phrase math anxiety. More recently, Ms. Tobias has focused on studying the American military. For example, she's a contributor to a book called What Kinds of Guns Are They Buying for Your Butter? A Beginner's Guide to Defense, Weaponry, and Milifer Military Spending. She is now teaching on gender politics at the University of California in San Diego, among her many other activities. Um, is she a feminist? Well, she says she is, and maybe that's true, and certainly she's a founder of the National Organization for Women. But does that mean she is not bright and objective? And I say definitely not from having read some of her work in the last week. I find it fascinating, informative, and objective. Um, from her preference to overcoming math anxiety to show the objectivity, she says, four years ago when I began this book, I hypothesized that mathematics anxiety and mathematics avoidance were feminist issues. Now I'm not so sure. She can change her mind a bit or at least uh, change some uh, preset views as well. This is a person I think we can listen to authoritatively. She has a recent book, which I do, do not mind in the least holding up and uh, urging you to take a look at. In fact, we have a couple of them I'll pass around. She is a contributor and co-author, Women, Militarism, and War, Essays in History, Politics, and Social Theory. Uh, the essay in this that she authored is uh, one of the bases for her talk today. So to give us some fresh views on what it takes to lead and to govern, and whether we can or maybe should construct a world in which conflicts are resolved in terms other than winning and losing. Here is today's speaker, Sheila Tobias. It's a pleasure to be here. My first trip to Oregon was in 1968 to campaign for Eugene McCarthy. And I remember Oregon is a great state then and now. My subject, Shifting Heroisms, How Men Use Their War Service in Politics, is like many topics feminist scholars select. It's based both on my research and my personal experience. I was born in the 1930s, and I was a child during World War II. That means I came of age in the 1950s when the feminine mystique was in full force. And it also means that was what was missing from my life at a very crucial point were mentors, women 15 or 20 years older than myself, who could have shown me the way. And so long before I became a feminist a historian and student of politics, I think I had in my soul the question, what had happened to the women who were born in the late teens and the 1920s? Why were they not in leadership positions in professional and political life? When I began to research this topic, I discovered some numbers that are very uh, important, that there were 11 women in Congress in 1945 going into the first election after World War II, and that that number was not achieved again until 1973. So there really is a question of absence to be addressed. The conventional wisdom among sociologists and historians is that war is liberating for women because it breaks the cake of custom. It gives them new avenues, opportunities, and mobility. But the war I knew, World War II, contradicted that truth. Later, when I studied Rosie the Riveter, a piece I called What Really Happened to Rosie the Riveter, I found that while women were welcomed into industrial employment in the 1940s, they were driven out of that employment, uh, not even legally, at the end of the war. And I found out that women who were professional, college-educated women, fared no better after World War II. In fact, what I discovered in the post-war research is that a grateful nation delivered on its promise to World War II veterans uh, with generous GI bills of rights and other benefits, but never recalled, remembered, or honored the women who had gone to work on the home front. And in fact, that population of women found themselves uh, degraded in their work lives and in their status. A second thing I discovered was that the uh, women whom I did interview, who had been of age 
in the 1940s but not at war, claimed that after the war it was very hard for them to claim leadership. And that was because, in their words, they had missed the searing experience of their generation, namely being at war and in combat, and it inhibited them in their attempt to call themselves equal to the men their age. And so I concluded that a return to normalcy after the war put women into a place they hadn't occupied for 50 years and that I needed to find out why. If popular wars were not good for women, and World War II was certainly, as we all remember, a very popular war, what about unpopular wars? How do women fare in political and professional life during an unpopular war? And when I put the question this way, I found an amazing coincidence, namely that during the Vietnam War, which was generally an unpopular war in the mid-60s to the mid-70s, we saw the rise of the second wave of feminism. This was another searing experience for a generation, especially for people then under 30, but it was an experience that was shared equally by the women and men who protested the war, like Jean McCarthy here, and by the men who fought. And so the women of that generation did not have to apologize for where they had been during that searing experience. They had been right there in the center of it. Was it a coincidence, I asked myself, that the new wave of feminism flourished during this period of an unpopular war, or going back to my generation, the so-called police action in Korea? Another contradiction I noticed when I ban began my research into war and politics is that our country is built very explicitly on the premise of civilian control of the military. The president is the commander of, in chief and the president is an elected civilian. More than that, the Constitution mandates that no man may run for office, woman either at this point, who is in uniform or on active service. That person must resign his commission in order to run for office. Yet, there is a reservoir of goodwill available for veterans of armed conflict. And that's the subject of my talk. Why? Some obvious reasons. It's a proof of patriotism. What greater proof is there of patriotism than one is prepared to put one's body on the line for one's country? And even those young men who return uh, alive and whole from war have, of course, lost uh, key years of their youth. But beyond that, it seems to me, and this is my contribution to this analysis, there is in our country, despite our commitment to civilian control over the military, a confusion in the voters' minds between leadership and command, particularly of command under fire. While I was researching my article, I came across some interesting evidence of this at work. Burton Barr, a man who, in my state of Arizona, was running then for the nomination for governor, was asked to speak to an audience not unlike this one, except that it was all women. And he said to this audience of women, quote, everything I needed to know to run this great state of Arizona, I learned on the battlefields of Europe in World War II. Quayle, who ran in 1988 with President Bush on his ticket, uh, made an attempt, a futile attempt as it turned out, to describe himself, and I'm quoting again, as a Vietnam era veteran, interesting use of words. <laughs> that, of course, backfired, as we all know, for him. And there was a tendency that I kept noticing of men in public life to embellish their war experience. And let me give you two examples. Early in the 1986 election season, Duke Tully, so-called Duke Tully, a legendary publisher and kingpin, again in Arizona, had to resign his several offices and essentially disappear from the political scene when it was revealed that for nearly 30 years he had lied about his military service in the U.S. Air Force and about the decorations he wore from his duty in Korea and Vietnam. Later that year, Royal Switzer, a Republican candidate for governor of Massachusetts, had to give up his candidacy when it was disclosed that he had, quote, embellished his military service. Switzer claimed to have been a Vietnam combat veteran, a captain in the Special Forces, a Green Beret. In truth, he had only served in the peacetime army with the rank of sergeant and merely visited Vietnam once in 1962, if you please. The importance of the connection between military service and political role is, I thought, a well exhibited by a comparison of veterans from World War II who ran for office immediately after that war, uh, a group of young men, many of whom are still in public service, and uh, those who were veterans of Vietnam. 
Those two wars were very different. I don't need to tell this audience. World War II was broadly supported. The Vietnam War was mired in controversy. But in the case of the post-World War II campaigns, references were made to duty and to the thrill of being in a victorious and very important war service. In the post-Vietnam War elections, the claim to leadership resided elsewhere, but resided still in that war service. Now it was not so much the resounding success of Vietnam, because it wasn't, as in World War II, but in its ambiguities. And those who ran for office after Vietnam as veterans claimed that the ambiguities of this war, its moral dilemmas, matured them gave them the skills and the greatness they needed to be our leaders. In both instances, I observed, war service is presented to the voter as the apprenticeship for leadership, the ultimate training ground for politics. I went back to the elections of 1946, where for the last time there were 11 women uh, in Congress, most of them running for re-election after the war, with every expectation that they would be a return to power. And I found that of the 11, only five were reelected. None of them ran directly, with one exception in a primary, against a returning veteran. So as an analyst, I cannot say to you definitively that a veteran beat a woman in any particular instance. But what I do notice, which is very interesting, is the manner in which the men who ran for office used their war service, particularly the men who had run from Congress. And I have some interesting tidbits to share with you. You've all heard of Joseph McCarthy. He ran the House Un-American Activities Committee in the 50s and became quite infamous for his work in Congress. What you may not have known is that in 1946, he was a returning GI. They called him, or he called himself, Tail Gunner Joe. He was uh, trying to restart a political career that had been interrupted. He'd been elected Wisconsin Circuit Judge in 1939, and he was protected as a judge from the draft. But he resigned in 1942 to join the Marines, reading quite correctly that if he hadn't participated in the war, it would cost him politically. He then uh, ran against a Milwaukee mayor, his chief competitor, who had resigned also to join the Navy. So it was clear what one had to do. Whatever his motives, McCarthy thereupon fictionalized his wartime service in a way that would become fairly common thereafter. He said he enlisted as a buck private, but actually had a commission. He claimed to have been wounded, and for that wound, he requested and received in 1952 a Purple Heart. He actually broke his leg by accident, we're told by his biographer. He claimed to have been a pilot. In reality, he was only a passenger on combat aircraft, occupying an empty tail gunner seat, and although he claimed to have done a lot of shooting at the enemy, others who flew with him said he generally unloaded his tail gun at the end of a mission on the poor, innocent coconuts. <laughs> sometimes he said he had 14 diving missions, sometimes 17, sometimes 30. The point was, then and still is, he recognized the value of war service for his politi political career, and while still in the service, he ran uh, for uh, office and won. The United States Constitution, as I said, unambiguously refuses to allow men in military uniform to serve their country as legislators. But there was a rash of enlistments during the early part of World War II among our Congress and, uh, congressmen and senators in the United States wishing to get into the conflict. It wasn't until 1942 that Roosevelt uh, issued a directive based on that constitutional mandate and gave these men the choice either to stay in the military and resign their seats or to resign the military and come home. Let's look at the case of Lyndon Johnson, politics of wartime service. During his campaign for an unexpired Senate seat in 1940, he promised his would-be constituents that, quote, if the day ever comes when my vote must be cast to send your boy to the trenches, that day Lyndon Johnson will leave his Senate seat and go with him. He repeated this promise in every speech he gave that year in what Carroll, his biographer, calls hawkish Texas. And then uh, in December 1941, when that day came, Johnson had no choice. He had already joined the Navy and had himself commissioned lieutenant commander in the Naval Reserve during the summer of 41. On December 11th, he was placed on active duty at the age of 33, rising in the House to say, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent for an indefinite leave of absence and got it. But after the directive of May 1942, and it looked as if he'd have to resign his seat, he changed his mind, and he returned his commission from the people who had given it to him and came back. 
Nixon was another interesting case. He was a Quaker. He went to a Quaker college. He came from a Quaker family. One would have thought that joining uh, the wartime effort would have uh, been a, a something of a contradiction uh, for his soul. Not so at all. After the war in 1946, his opponent was a man named Jerry Voorhees, a Democrat from California who'd first been elected in 1936 and had served in Congress through the war. Taking advantage of his war service, Nixon circulated flyers during the campaign depicting Voorhees as one who, and I'm quoting, stayed safely behind the front in Washington while Nixon, and I'm quoting, was a clean, forthright American who fought in defense of his country in the stinking mud and jungles of the Solomons. Well, how stinking, how muddy it was is probably indisputable, but how much he fought has been uh, reanalyzed by biographers. And I quote Gary Willis, a biographer, quote, it is true that Bougainville, where Nixon was stationed, was bombed while he was there, but his assignment was to move from island to island behind the line of advance, part of the lengthening umbilical cord of supply. He got to know his fellows, not in foxholes, as he would later claim, but across the table during endless wartime poker games. Later, much later, much later, Nixon modified his own claims. In 1952, he said more modestly, my service record was not a particularly unusual one, I went to the South Pacific. I guess I'm entitled to a couple of battle stars. I got a couple of letters, letters of commendation, but I was just there when the bombs were falling and I returned. Let's look at the losers, the women who ran in 46 against men like these. As I said, the total number were 11 and only five returned. Uh, one of them uh, used the war service in an interesting way. Her name is Elizabeth Taft Douglas of Illinois, and she and her husband, Paul Douglas, some of you may remember, had an interesting marriage, a rather modern marriage. They both had political ambitions, and together they'd made a 10-year plan to run alternately for Congress from Illinois. Initially, it was Paul Douglas who was to stand first as the at-large candidate, but war came and he enlisted as a private in the Marines. He spent several years overseas in Asia, and in June 1945 was discharged with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel with a Bronze Star. While he was away, Emily Taft Douglas, his political wife, ran successfully for Congress in 1944. Thus, when the election of 1946 rolled around, she was the incumbent, and her husband became a supporting member of her re-election team. She had a tough race on her hand because uh, her opponent, William Grant Stratton, who later became governor of Illinois, had uh, done service in the Navy. And so her trick was the following. She always appeared in pictures during her campaign with her husband dressed in his full Marine uniform. And her newspaper advertisements uh, ran these pictures with herself, her husband, their 13-year-old daughter, under the, over the following caption. Quote, Congressman at large Emily Taft Douglas left shown with her husband, Major Paul Douglas, who has just returned after four years of Marine Corps service, and their 13-year-old daughter, Judy. It didn't help. She lost the election. Another candidate, whom we've never heard of since, was named Catherine Falvey, and she had the honor of running against John Fitzgerald Kennedy, not in a regular uh, uh, campaign, but given the Democratic uh, control of that particular uh, House seat from Massachusetts, the real campaign was for the primary. John Kennedy was 29 years old in 1946 and had never held a civilian job when he decided to become one of 10 candidates for the open Democratic seat in the 11th district. Catherine Falvey, the other aspirant, was not his most formidable opponent, but she's of interest to a historian like myself because she was a woman lawyer, a former state representative, and a WAC major still in service. She wore her dress whites while campaigning. And she referred to Kennedy as, quote, the poor little rich kid. But she did not anticipate what all that could bring. Kennedy ran unabashedly on his war record. According to the private polls funded by his father, this is what people were interested in. At one point during the campaign, Kennedy headquarters mailed to every registered Democratic voter in the 11th District a copy of the condensed Reader's Digest version of John Hersey's New Yorker article about Kennedy's heroism. Much local newspaper space was devoted to that record, and in nearly every public address, Kennedy told the PT-109 story over and over again, always in the third person, as if it were happening to someone else. And I quote, the commanding officer of the PT-109, believing it to be a Japanese destroyer, turned the bow of his PT to meet a torpedo head on. Pretty wonderful. 
Ambassador Kennedy's father believed that the election of, uh, that is Ambassador Kennedy, John's father, believed the election of 1946 would be determined by the men and women who'd experienced the war as a jumping off point in their lives. In a district in which there were 37 different ethnic nationalities, veteran status became the common denominator. And in the end, Kennedy outpolled all his opponents, winning 42% of the vote. Catherine Falvey came in fifth and was never heard from again. Recently, Dave Powers, who was Kennedy's campaign director in 1946, revealed that the decision to emphasize the war record was based on a more sophisticated analysis and strategy than simply offering the voters an opportunity to vote for the soldier who'd made it back. He said in a, in a public interview that at the time, their biggest fear was that Kennedy's wealthy Harvard background would be a serious liability in a largely working class district. To guard against this, they developed a particular strategy in regard to the war record. The plan was to emphasize not the heroism, but the ordinariness of Kennedy's war, war experience, to depict Kennedy as a man who had fought side by side with working class boys. And the campaign staff regularly marched the candidate with veterans in parades and had him speak to veterans groups as a way to make that image stick. Leaving World War II and looking at Vietnam, it would have appeared in the initial years after the war in Vietnam was concluded in 1970s that it would have been very hard for veterans of that war to run for office. For one reason, there was the sociology of that conflict. This was a war in which only career officers fought and uh, men from southern Appalachia, uh, minority enlisted men, ethnic and poor men. The middle class that usually produces candidates for national office was conspicuously absent from that war. However, there was a spate of, of candidates that I decided uh, to look at starting in 1986. What's interesting about these men, many of whom are now in Congress, in, in, and one of them is, uh, just was defeated, he's Oregon's uh, Denny Smith, is that they don't agree on politics, uh, not even on party affiliation. They don't even agree on the war in Vietnam. Uh, John Kerry, who's the junior senator from Massachusetts, was the returning Vietnam veteran who organized Vietnam veterans against the war and made his reputation as an opponent to the war. Uh, Jeremiah Denton was a POW who suffered seven years of abuse in uh, North Vietnam, as was John McCain, who's the senator uh, from my state of Arizona, also a POW. So we have a very varied group of men. But what unites them, in my view, my analysis is, that their military service, whatever the ultimate political meaning they take from that service, provides background and political legitimacy, uh, something that women, as I will argue, cannot match. Looking at them in more detail, we find that Jeremiah Denton, who ran unsuccessfully for a second term in 1986, very explicitly used that POW war service in his campaign. And I quote from a circular he uh, mailed out just before to raise money. He said, although I endured seven and a half years of captivity as a POW in North Vietnam, my upcoming reelection campaign presents me with the toughest challenge of my life. Back then, as every day dawned, I was forced to summon the strength and spirit to save my life, to make it one more day. But the issues confronting us today involve not only my life, but the lives of my family, your family, and those of men and women across our great nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. John McCain, another POW, first elected from Arizona to the House and now our senator, uh, is an interesting case because he might have had a great career as an admiral. He was the son and grandson of admirals in the Navy when he was shot down over Vietnam, which interrupted that career. But what he says of his time in Vietnam is, uh, I wasn't drafted, I wanted to serve. Senator Larry Pressler from South Dakota is another very interesting case. He was a Rhodes Scholar in England during the uh, Vietnam War, and he suddenly volunteered. He left the Rhodes Scholarship and suddenly volunteered for two years of active duty in, in Vietnam. Uh, it's not clear whether he was motivated by the sense that his age mates were dying for him and he was just sitting in Oxford studying, or whether he was looking ahead to what has become a very successful political career in South Dakota. He returned from Vietnam to co complete an academic program in politics and in law, and uh, ran first for office in the late 1970s. Your Denny Smith here in Oregon, 
was uh, another interesting case. He was, one might say, in politics to the manor born. He was the son of a governor. Uh, his family owns a major newspaper chain here in the state. But when he uh, came of age, instead of entering his family's newspaper business, he entered the Air Force, where he flew 180 combat missions in one year in Vietnam and was decorated with the Air M Medal. And uh, one is left to ask oneself, whether those 12 years spent in the Air Force and later as a civilian pilot contributed more to his ability to run successfully for office, uh, to his proof of leadership than had he gone into his family's business. Another interesting case is that of Bob Kerry, who was governor of Nebraska when I began my research and has since become senator from Nebraska. Uh, he is a, uh, a wounded veteran of Vietnam. He actually has a uh, prosthesis leg uh, beneath his knee. And uh, when he speaks of, of the war, it's of a, with a very uh, important message. He came back uh, not totally opposed to the war, but mu much more skeptical about war as a means of solving problems, and very critical of uh, uh, macho uh, groups like uh, certain veterans of foreign wars. And partly because of the confusion of his name, he's Kerry with an E, and John Kerry of Massachusetts is Kerry without an E. His opponent in his campaign for governor uh, tried to uh, spread confusion that he was the one who threw his medals into a coffin at an anti-war rally. And what I found reading the uh, case study of that campaign was that Kerry was virtually attack-proof on that issue. He could, have, he could be skeptical about war, he could be a peace activist, he could be critical of the veterans of foreign wars. He even came uh, to the idea uh, that he might offer an alternate national service, a non-military national service for young people, but he could not be attacked on that issue because he talked of his months in uh, military hospitals and he said of that time, the ward was full of the refuse of war, we were its end product. While his response tends to be low key, uh, his opponent did not have a chance to question his patriotism. He is wearing a Medal of Honor. He no longer has the full use of his limbs. And so there is this uh, shared uh, commonality in the biographies of this man that make it clear to me at least that service in war gives veterans a stock of political capital that they can use at will. Whether they're career military, enlisted men, or draftees, they can claim familiarity with the military in addition to personal sacrifice and patriotism. As retiring Senator Barry Goldwater said in his 1986 endorsement of Evan Meekham, of all people, the candidate then for governor of Arizona, and a former Air Force officer like himself, he said, and I quote, you know a man when you know him in the air, meaning at the controls of a military plane. The question I ask is, how do you know a woman? And how can she demonstrate her leadership, her experience, her patriotism, her dedication, and most important, her competence in matters of foreign and military policy? And so I turned on completion of that research to an interesting moment in our history, the debate between Ferraro and Bush in their uh, 1984 campaign, when Ferraro was the first woman selected to be a vice presidential running mate of, of a Democratic candidate. Uh, both uh, vice presidents were in the spotlight. It was a very important second debate and uh, George Bush uh, let loose. First, he called her uh, patronizingly Mrs. Ferraro instead of uh, candidate Ferraro. And then uh, when she asked, are we going to take proper precautions before we put Americans in situations where they are in danger in reference to the deaths of the Marines in Lebanon, Bush rejoined, let me help you, Mrs. Ferraro, with the distinction between Iran and Lebanon. Very patronizing. And then he said, uh, later, and as did the reporters later too, Congresswoman Ferraro, you have had little or no experience in military matters, and yet you might find yourself someday commander-in-chief of the armed forces. How can you convince the American people and the potential enemy that you would know what to do to protect the nation's security, and do you think in any way that the Soviets, then our lethal enemy, might be tempted to try to take advantage of you simply because you're a woman? This was a serious question she was asked as candidate. Ferraro remembers, this is from our autobiography, responding immediately, quote, are you saying that I would have to have fought in a war in order to learn to love peace? She went on, equating military experience with the ability to defend our country is about as valid as saying you have to be black in order to despise racism, that you'd have to be female in order to be offended by sexism. If I were in a position of leadership when the Soviet Union were to challenge our country militarily, the Russians would be assured that they would be met with swift, concise, and certain retaliation. But those words in the mouth of a woman who had never fought 
were not taken very seriously bush said in his closing statement at that debate yes this was the prepared statement i did serve in combat i was shot down when i was a young kid scared to death and all that day i saw friends die but that heightened my convictions about peace he didn't depict himself as cool or heroic but he certainly made it clear to the listening audience that he had participated in that searing experience of our lives. What a pointless resume for leadership, Ferraro wrote two years later in her autobiography, excluding half the population. If you hadn't fought at the halls of Montezuma, ran the argument, you couldn't understand the need for peace on the shores of Tripoli. Later, she recalled, the press did not let go of that issue. Uh, Marvin Kalb on Meet the Press asked candidate Ferraro if she thought she was, quote, strong enough to push the button. If her candidacy as a woman was being judged the same as a man's, she asked in turn, would she still have to answer questions like that? She said the question of button pushing was so simplistic. Rather, she said, why didn't we debate whether force should be used only when every other avenue is exhausted? Whether or not I had the knowledge and the intelligence and the fortitude to move towards arms control negotiations. That was the question, she said, that should have been asked. No, she said, my strength in ordering the destruction of the world dominated this campaign. American women were present in the war in Vietnam. There were 10,000 of them serving their country, 7,000 of them as nursing staff, and there were 30,000 more recently in Saudi Arabia. The question is that though women are volunteering more and more for military service, particularly as previously restricted combat uh, jobs are opening to them, will it be likely that women will use their war service in the way men do in politics? If not, we are going to have to find ways to render women candidates more credible in their competence for national office. What might be some of those ways? One might be to describe marriage and child rearing as worthy of veteran status. <laughs> Surely anyone who survives and successfully brings a family through the myriad of challenges that families are wont to give women ought to be given some kind of medal, if not a veteran status. But uh, more seriously, uh, peace activism, in which many women are uh, very, very committed, to which they're committed, is never quite the same as war service. And we see that not only when it affects women, but also men. Bruce Babbitt was a candidate for the nomination for president of the Democratic Party a few years ago. Bruce Babbitt did not serve his country in war. He went into the Peace Corps upon graduating from college. And I noticed, I don't know how many others did who know him well, that he downplayed that experience in his campaign. So peace activism, family life, doesn't seem to cut it the way military service does. In my uh, observations as a political analyst, it seems to me the only thing that comes close to competing with military service uh, for uh, rank in the leadership chain is sports. What will the post-Persian Gulf period be like? And what will it mean for women trying to serve their country in a civilian office? As I mentioned, there were 30,000 women uh, serving their country in Saudi Arabia. And I was pleased to notice that they uh, not only demonstrated their mettle, their commitment, their ability as warriors, but that our media learned to say our men and women in Saudi Arabia very, very well. And that the country knew, if they didn't read the details, that there were women fighting over there along with men. Uh, the second thing I noticed about that Persian Gulf coverage was that it was now for the first time in, in my recollection of politics possible for men about to leave for Saudi Arabia to reveal some of their less than macho feelings about going to war. You saw men on television clinging to their newborn children, uh, tearful, uh, able to uh, reveal some fear and some real emotions about war, and I thought that was uh, to the good. But at the same time, women were conspicuously absent in our country and, of course, in the Muslim Middle East from the leadership roles, either in civilian or military. They played no particular role in uh, this war. And with the recent return of our very successful generals and loose talk about a possible President Powell or President Schwarzkopf, I wonder what the future holds. What can we do? I think the most we can do, the beginning we can do, certainly groups of you as in City Club, is to begin to think seriously and critically about our nation's tendency to conflate leadership with leadership in war. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Mr. Bias. There was a lot in that address, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking up questions out there now, too, for you. But our first question will come from our board host, Chuck Williams. Excellent speech, Professor Tobias. Um, back in the uh, very early 1970s, when my uh, draft number came up, it was, uh, I think it, my birthday happened to fall on draft number 165. My draft board got up to 163. After your speech, I'm wondering if maybe that wasn't a very good outcome. <laughs> no, it was fine. Um, I really think about uh, issues of, of uh, leadership and um, during of experiences my generation faced that, uh, as you say, came of age during the Vietnam War, and you alluded to that a little bit. Um, but I also feel that so many leaders who came out of that generation had nothing to do with the military. Certainly not everyone in my generation were in the military. Um, and uh, you make a very good distinction between uh, command and leadership, a very important distinction. I think about uh, uh, General Schwarzkopf, who's automatically assumed to be a leading candidate for the next presidential election, um, although perhaps uh, happily he has other ideas in mind. Um, where do you think uh, leadership uh, has more realistically come from, uh, both in that generation of the 70s and the generation of the 90s? You know who they are. They're all lawyers. <laughs> I, also, I make a further distinction that might be relevant to this audience between leadership, command, and management. And my notion of leadership might be a little ideal or unrealistic. But I do see leaders as people who have visions that other people are not comfortable yet entertaining. And so uh, ideally, I think that leaders should come from uh, thinkers uh, in a platonic sense, uh, from people who are above the nitty gritty of uh, uh, making uh, themselves wealthy, <laughs> and uh, people who will see public office as what it's supposed to be, an opportunity for service. Which of the many occupations will generate this kind of leader is really not for me to say, except that we certainly ought to have a less homogeneous group in the legislature. Uh, although I do have deep reverence for lawyers, it seems to me we ought to have at least one scientist making policy that will affect our country into the 21st century, a couple of teachers, which Lyndon Johnson incidentally was before he ran for office. Uh, certainly some of the people involved in uh, labor negotiation, people who represent the uh, awareness of the needs of our working people and people who have been primarily parents. Thank you. When you spoke of scientists in leadership positions, sur surely you didn't mean John Sununu, did you? <laughs> <laughs> our second question from the floor is from Tom Stanwood, chair of the uh, Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, Chuck's comments. Uh, was excellent speech. Uh, my question of you is, in the 1990s, how can uh, good, strong women candidates run against men with military experience, and how do they, quote, combat, unquote, the perception in the mind of the public that military experience automatically makes good leaders? That, of course, is, as they used to say, the $64,000 question. I believe that there are certain uh, occupations that when women fill them, uh, it makes their, their courage, their fortitude, their intellect uh, indisputable. I would say, for example, just to have you think about this, Sally Ride might have a good crack at challenging anybody who had fought anybody anywhere, uh, having gone out into space, having uh, a PhD in physics, and incidentally, having dedicated herself after her astronaut period of her career to arms control, the technical study of arms control and arms control negotiation. However, a very important prerequisite for national leadership is knowledge about defense weapons military spending. And part of the reason I wrote the book in the 80s called uh, The People's Guide to National Defense in, uh, for a lay reader was to urge my sisters who do have such ambitions and who have eschewed such subjects, considering them too macho or masculine, to become mistresses, uh, if not masters, of this material. It does take one third of our budget. I mean, that peace dividend came and went very quickly. We now spend $300 billion out of a $1 trillion budget on the military, and it certainly behooves anyone who is seeking to take some national leadership, which will involve a resource allocation, to understand uh, the intricacies of strategic defense. 
uh, Professor Tobias, uh, would, what would you advise a woman who had served in the Persian Gulf and was running for public office, what would you advise her with respect to publicizing her service? Well, uh, let's put it this way. There, uh, as I understand the sociology of, of autobiography or biography, a woman who served in the Persian Gulf is very little likely to be running for public office because those women have selected the military with a different agenda. They are, for the most part, uh, career military officers or career military enlisted people. They will stay in for 25 years. The point I was trying to make is that lots of men, even in peacetime, select the military as a loop a, pro a productive loop through which to pass in order to get back on their main track, which is politics. And, and, I, and Larry Pressler is a very good example. He was well on his way to that JD degree, to the master's in political science. He takes two years out of that life to do the Vietnam War service, knowing that he'll be held accountable for not having done it. So if we did find some women running, and I think that major of the helicopter, whose name escapes me at the moment, who died in combat, might have been an interesting candidate. I would hope that they would uh, use their combat service to demonstrate their patriotism, uh, refer to it obliquely or in a modest way to show their leadership skills, but certainly not dwell on it as much as it has been dwelled on before. Not, not seeing any questions. Oh, oh I do see another one. Yeah. Okay. I'm Karen Katz, club member. Um, during the crisis, there was discussion among women who do serve in the military about their inability to get ahead in the Pentagon and to be leaders, maybe not in the political sense of having run for office, but uh, as leaders in the Pentagon at the board table. Can you comment on that? And what is the responsibility of women who are in the military to stay, stick it out, and fight for equality? I believe that we have a responsibility as women to, to do everything uh, to serve the country that, that the men do. And so for the women who select the military because of their personal inclinations and their skills, they do have an obligation to stay in the military and also to uh, stay in the civilian roles in the Pentagon and play a role. And we do have more and more women getting PhDs in strategic studies, uh, attending the, the war colleges and becoming very expert. And they will in time uh, find their way. But I noticed just this week when uh, the word is getting out now about how that very clever a Vicksburg-like strategy was invented uh, by which our servicemen went, uh, feigned a la uh, sea attack and then went around uh, to the west and sneaked up on the, uh, on the Iraqi forces, that that was designed by a bunch of clever young men uh, at some war college, and it was made to be the work of, of males again. So we've got to de-genderize strategy and de-genderize war peace issues if, if women are going to play a role on in any of these critical issues. Robin Morgan, who's a writer for Ms. Magazine, commented on the day after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, lest we think our country is the, the worst offender. Today, she said, one half of Iraq invaded one half of Kuwait. If we think about the absence of our women from key roles in that war, think of the absence of their women who only died. Peter Stevens, City Club member. Professor Tobias, many of us uh, watched and read and listened to much of your earlier work in math anxiety, those, particularly those of us who are educators. Now I, I would ask you to share with us what your advice might be for those of us who are educators, particularly in the elementary, the secondary school level, advice for our children as they grow up in this world, particularly for girls but also for boys. Yeah, I found mathematics to be the filter, the critical filter through which uh, people pass whatever their occupations in order to master both technical material and also, as I put it, even to speak the language of modern day. I very often advise English majors that if they're not up to taking differential equations, at least learn what the slope of the curve means. So that when you're at a meeting and somebody says, well, look at those numbers, and you can say blithely, well, it depends, of course, on the slope of the curve. That'll buy you at least one promotion, if not the president. So uh, in, in truth, this has become a language, a lingua franca of management, of thought, it's a very p empowering language. Uh, words like entropy, learns uh, words like differences at the margin are the subject. And anyone who is locked out of that language, not to mention those skills, is at a disadvantage. There are some number of people who will always select the arts, 
or the humanities, uh, areas in which mathematics is not the current language, but they will be fewer and fewer. And so for her sake, as well as the sake of her family that may depend on her income, she uh, is well advised to take as much mathematics as she can. Yeah. Caroline Loker, City Club member. Would you comment on the role of sports a bit further in the shaping of leaders? I do think sports, I meant that not just as an aside, I do think sports are a training ground for all kinds of leadership, uh, if for no other reason, and I mean team sports. Women uh, have excelled traditionally and continue to excel very much in individual sports, whether it's uh, uh, skiing or uh, tennis, or of course that's played with two people, but one is on your side and one isn't, or um, uh, such sports, and that demonstrates that women have the physical prowess, the drive, the determination, the discipline to be fine athletes. But uh, the playing on a team is what teaches uh, our children very young uh, the value of the team, that the person who passes well should pass to the person who shoots well and that there is a collective responsibility for success and an importance in delegating certain kinds of tasks. And I think our, our women are deprived. When I, things are better, thanks to Title IX uh, of the 1972 uh, Act, Higher Education Amendments Act, we now must give proportionally as much money to female sports as male sports. But in my day, just to tell you what life was like in the 40s and 50s when I was in school, the only team sport for girls was cheerleading. What message did, did that send out? Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Mel Gertov, a uh, City Club member. Um, you said that your main concern was to degenderize, and yet I also would have to assume from the flavor of your talk that you're really interested also in demilitarizing. How do you separate the two? How do you separate the, the socializing experience of being in the military and being in a, in a real war, or for that matter, of being in graduate school in strategic seminars, uh, which is what I teach in, mm -hmm. um, for women, from uh, the values that can come out of that experience. Well, we have to assume that there is a substantive subject that one masters, and then a, an understanding of its purpose. Perhaps I can answer that best by reporting to you what I found when I interviewed missile women. These are the women in uh, Montana, uh, Air Force officers who are selected for a very high ability, stamina and discipline, uh, to man our deterrent, which was, of course, our, our first line of defense against possible Soviet nuclear attack for, for many, many years. And I went up there to ask essentially this kind of question, what kind of women do this job? And what do they think about the job they do? And what I found was uh, extreme professionalism, absolute dedication to doing the job as well as they can, but complete conviction that theirs was a deterrent function and that they would feel very good if, very good, if at the end of their rotation through the missile service, they had never had to do that job except in training. So I think you can separate out the professional capability uh, uh, from the other. One of the reasons I think we have gotten such a skewed uh, picture of nuclear issues, for example, is that people in the peace movement, uh, and I certainly admire them and identify with them in some respects, have not really understood something as complex as deterrence theory and those who do understand it might have a, a more moderate view of, of the nation's uh, defense. So I do think it's possible among, among intelligent people to master something without being co-opted by it. Um, you mentioned Title IX is one of the ways that women um, at school age and in college have an, are getting access or have been given the opportunity for access to sports um, and that with that, I got on to some other advances like that over the last 15 or 20 years that give, that have forced society at large to give women opportunities to um, reach the same levels as men in schooling and then in professional sector. I have some feeling that those kinds of advances are, have been jeopardized by the eight years of the Reagan administration and by the present administration. There's certainly a lot of talk in um, this state about Title IX funding, and I read a little bit that, about that in other places. Actually, Title IX, like many statutes, uh, needs to be not funded but enforced. You don't need any money. All you have to do is uh, be hard-nosed about it and insist that uh, where there is a male athletic uh, activity, there is at least a counterpart activity. Let me say, though, for the record, since I'm interested in history, and I think history is very enlightening, that nothing in the 70s was fought harder than that sports item 
in Title IX. The entire National Collegiate Athletic Association came down with its guns blasting, pardon the metaphor, <laughs> against the possibility that women's sports could possibly be considered as important as men's sports. And along the way, they wrote all these amendments to exempt what they called contact sports. Of course, you know what they were trying to exempt, football. And it was a feminist with a wonderful wit who said publicly at a hearing in Congress, football isn't a contact sport. Football is a collision sport. Dancing is a contact sport. <laughs> So we had our fun with it, but I don't think it's funding. If they tell you it's funding, they're not being uh, forthright. Okay. It's just enforcement. Well, that was actually just the preliminary to my question being where, for advances like that, where are the people in the Bush administration that are protecting those advances? Um, where are, there's, there isn't a visible woman now at all in the Bush administration, and we've asked a little bit about leadership um, from this generation, but I don't see the people that, would be labeled as from earlier generations that are there now at least protecting the progress that we've made. All the more reason to be vigilant and to keep the grassroots fires burning bright. Last question, perhaps, or we have a little more time. Uh, One Mary more. McWilliams, City Club member. Uh, how long will it be then until we get a woman president? Well, I, uh, I think it'll be as long as it took Nebraska to get a woman governor. My prediction is when two women are running, a Democrat and a Republican will have a woman president. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Sheila Tobias. I want to add uh, one, one final note here. At 8 o'clock tonight, this person of many talents is speaking at Portland State University and the title of her address is, Why Science is Hard. It isn't hard. That's, isn't that the whole point? <laughs> As we adjourn, let us again thank our speaker, Sheila Tobias, for a very wonderful presentation. <laughs>